So yeah, tonight we want to look at those three signs that uh, Butch just read from uh, Exodus chapter four. When uh, Moses was at the burning bush, you know, the God revealed his memorial name to Moses, uh, but he also gave him, and the story continues, that event continues into chapter four, when God gives him these three signs. And tonight I want to look at how these three signs, I think, point back to three lies. Uh, the A lot of, I should say, the majority of what I share tonight uh, is not like original to me. I have to uh, give credit to a Jewish rabbi by the name of uh, David Foreman, who has a podcast that actually brought out a lot of these things. Uh, and thinking about how lies really are uh, hit or are hidden here in this text and actually pointed to uh, the, when you dig into it, it brought out uh, some some cool things to help uh, really understand how the genocide really that that the Egyptians were carrying out start with 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 lies. And the current events and seeing like the horrible things that people were doing in in Israel, uh, you know, a week and a half ago, and and you know the horrible things that continue in, in war, it, it kind of got me thinking about like you know, how could people do the things they're doing to children, and and it really comes down to these lies. These lies are what allow the Egyptians to do horrible things to children and to, to, to be able to, without feeling guilty, you know, cast children into the, into the Nile river uh, and kill them. That kind of, you know, heinous acts come because of, because, because of these lies that are at the source and God with these three signs is really addressing these lies. And uh, so when I saw the news, it kind of made me think back this this podcast, I think I heard like a year and a half ago, um, but the the lessons were pretty powerful. So um, I thought I would share those with you guys tonight. Um, so we we had those three lies that Butch uh, read for us, the, the lie, uh, or sorry, the three signs, sorry, the staff uh, that becomes a serpent, uh, the hand that becomes leprous, and the and then the Nile that become, or sorry, the, the the water of the Nile that becomes blood on the dry ground. So those are the three signs. And the first question is like, why why did these signs? Why did God give these signs to Moses? Um, so in the context, as we said, remember this is when when God was speaking to to Moses at the burning bush, and He reveals His name. God gives a message to bring to Pharaoh and to Israel uh, in uh, verses 16 of chapter 3. God says, go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to me saying, I have observed you and what has been done in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land, the land of the Canaanites, uh, Perizzites, and so on, and up to the Je Jebusite. So God's promising deliverance for his people. So this is the, the context. And uh, that word that's, that's there in the ESV, I have observed you, uh, is, uh, I think, translated in the King James as... Uh, Sure, visit maybe surely visit you. I did you know some research into this word, and one uh, lexicon mentions that uh, out of all the the verbs in the Hebrew language, this one, which actually occurs over three hundred times, is the most probably is given translators the most difficulty. Um, it's just a it's a really hard word to 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 pin down somewhat, uh, and the. The the word uh, the way the way that Foreman translated it was to say that it means to remember with intent to redeem, and uh, 
that I think is powerful, powerful way that it's that, that capturing the meaning of that word. Uh, in the NET translation, which has excellent notes, they, they have a note about this word that says, uh, pakad, the Hebrew word there, has traditionally been rendered to visit. But this only partially communicates the point of the word. When God visited someone, it meant that he intervened in their lives to change their circumstance or their destiny. When he visited the Amalekites, he destroyed them. When he visited Sarah, same word, he provided the long-awaited child. In Genesis 21, verse 1, it, del- it refers to God's active involvement in human affairs for blessing or for cursing. So here it could mean that God had begun to act to deliver the Israelites from bondage and to give them the blessings of the covenant. The form is joined here with the infinitive absolutive. There's a grammatical term that just means the doubling of the words that we have, like you will surely die or you will, um, in Genesis 3 being the most famous example of that. So it underscores the certainty. I have indeed visited you. Some translate it to remember. Others say watch over. The ESV had uh, observed you. These do not capture the idea of intervention to bless, as and often with the idea of vengeance or judgment on the oppressors. If God were to visit what the Egyptians did, he would stop the oppression and also bring retribution for it. End quote. So there's a richness to this message that we 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 miss and and the difficulty that translators have of capturing the meaning of this word. Um, so this is why God was giving them, giving him the signs. He's, he's, he's going to, well, it's coming, sorry, in the next, let's look at one more verse and we'll understand why God was giving Moses the signs. It says in chapter four, verse one, then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice for they, they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. So God's telling Moses Go and, and tell them that I've, I've, I've observed you. I've, uh, I've seen what you're going through. I intend to redeem you. Uh, I intend to bring justice. But Moses was fearing that the, the people wouldn't, wouldn't believe him. So the signs that, that God gave Moses were God's response to this assertion that they won't believe me. So that's why there were signs. Why these particular signs? Why these three? So ask yourself, if, if some traveling preacher were coming through and he did these per- three particular magic tricks to convince you to believe that he was sent from God, would they be enough to convince you to follow him? Or you know, if you were God, think about you have the ability to give Moses way more impressive signs than these to ensure the people are convinced, right? So it's not about, it's not about just the, the miraculousness of the signs. It's about something that they communicate. Um, I mean, well, just to drive home the point, think about some of the signs have overlap. Like in chapter five, Moses, Pharaoh's magicians uh, cast their staffs and they turn into snakes. And they, they poured water and it had it turned into blood. Um, so, you know, God could have picked something more dramatic and he could have picked something that the regular magicians of, of Pharaoh's court couldn't do. But yet he chose these particular signs. So in one sense, you might think eh, they're not quite impressive enough. Um, and yet when Moses meets the elders at the end of chapter four, they believe Uh, We read in chapter 4, verse 29, Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. So 
these the signs did their job. They convinced the people. Uh, but I don't think it's just because of the fact that they were miracles. I think it was that there must have been something in those signs um, that that communicated an important message to the Israelites. So let's put, to help us answer the question, why these signs? Let's put on the top here, I'm putting, re- putting again God's message that he's saying that Moses had to bring to the elders, that I have observed you. So we'll put that with the result from chapter four together. Uh, oops, I shouldn't have put that all on build. But anyway, uh, so there's the linkage. First of all, there's the linkage um, that God said, I have observed you, that uh, I've uh, seen with the intent to, and I'm remembering with the intent to redeem what happened to you. That's that word, pakad. And the belief of the of the people is expressed with the same Hebrew word, but in English we get a different translated word um, where it says visited the people of Israel. The people believed, they heard that the Lord had visited the people. That was that same word. Okay. That um, so there's that linkage. That there's it has to one connection is it has to do with this uh, what God is doing here. He's he's telling them he he's remembering with the intent to redeem them. Uh, so it's not just believing in God as an in intellectual way. The signs are about what this, what this, what they, they're about communicating to the people that God really knows what they've been suffering and what they've been going through. It was meant, uh, it meant that he was intervening in their lives to change both their circumstances and their destiny. He was remembering them and what was done to them with the intent to redeem both. So it wasn't just, I've observed you, uh, or I will come and, and, and miraculously uh, change your destiny, but it's, I'm remembering what has been done to you. And, and, uh, and then the, the people saw that he re- visited the people of Israel, them, and he had seen their affliction. So there's this, connection it's not just what he was going to do in in promising to to uh rescue them from their current affliction but he was going to redeem the past um the past why was the past so important why did it have to go back to the past it's because the suffering in egypt wasn't just about the suffering in slavery but it was also about the lies when, when people are victimized and lied about or lied to, it's especially harmful, the combination of those two. Redemption involves addressing the lies. What happened to the victims is acknowledged, and it's made clear that it was real. That's part of the redemption process. The three signs convinced the Israelites because they those signs addressed the lies. So how did these signs communicate this to the Israelites? Why, um, you know, well, to try to answer that question, we want to try to look for the meanings of the signs. Well, the first, or the, sorry, the third sign was the most obvious, according to what God was telling me. He said, okay, you know, do the first sign, and if they don't believe, then do the second sign, and if they still don't believe, then do the first sign. And they're, they're definitely going to... With the with the implication, they're definitely going to believe after the third sign. So there's something about the third sign that would have helped them get it first, or, or most obviously. And then, as they reflected on the earlier signs, they would understand as well. I think is the idea that's being um, hidden or being revealed to us. So let's think about it. What is it about that first sign? The um, the water going uh, onto the ground. What's the meaning of that sign? To have, to understand that, I think we have a hint if we look forward to the first plague. Because the first plague mirrors this this first sign uh, somewhat, or the third sign, I'm sorry. The the first plague mirrors the third sign. 
when the Nile turned to blood. And if we think about the two of them, they are so the pouring out the water of the Nile and, and it's revealed as blood and the Nile itself turning to blood. And what is that pointing to? What is God revealing? I think God is revealing the worst thing that the Israelites had endured when the genocide went to the point of like casting those boys, baby boys into the Nile. Why did the, they were killing the baby boys. Why did Pharaoh have them use the Nile to do it? If you think about it, the, the, the point was to, to kind of cover up the crime, to cover up their sin. The victims would be hidden. We read in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 22, that when Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Uh, so he was having them throw those victims, the baby boys, into the Nile because it was hiding the, uh, the crime. And a... Medieval uh, Jewish scholar by the name of Rambam uh, suggested that the all his people in this verse wasn't just the servants, like his all his hired you know, servants or, or, or something like that, but it was the, all the people of the nation were being called to commit these heinous acts. Um, and they would, you know, so in his imagination, he's thinking through, you know, what could that have been like? He's thinking in the middle of the night, Egyptians should go could go in and take a, a Hebrew boy, throw them in the Nile, and then you know the the, the if if the the Jewish victims are like you know what, what they've done to us, you bring in the authorities. Where's the where's the evidence? There's no evidence. Nothing happened here. So it's it's a, a lie that's being used to cover up the the violence that was done to the Israelites. And, and and as this is happening, it does it does bad things to your mind to to be victimized and lied about, and, and having the the truth covered up really by nature. The, the the Nile is hiding the truth of the reality that their children were murdered, until the Nile turns to blood. They realize it's clear they aren't, they weren't crazy. The Egyptians were really killing their children. The Nile is not hiding it anymore. And God is showing, he's making it clear for all to see. God says, I see your suffering. I know what they did to you. Egyptians now have a choice. Could They could own up to it. Pharaoh could say, yeah, oh, I get what the message is. Um, I've really wronged you guys. Um, he could let the Israelites go. But instead, the process continues because he hardened his heart. So that's, I think, what the first sign is, is pointing to, the lie that, you know, nothing's really happened to your, your baby boys. It, there's no evidence. Okay? That, that's, that's made clear when the Nile reveals that it was, it was filled with the blood of innocent children. So what about the second sign? Uh, what could that leprous hand be pointing to? Part of the hint is that only one other person in the Torah was ever afflicted by lep with leprosy. And that was, that was, of course, Miriam. And when Aaron described it, uh, this is what we read in Numbers chapter 12. Um, when the cloud removed from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous like snow. And Aaron turned toward Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and we have sinned. Let her not be as one dead. So Aaron makes a connection to the leprosy and death. And he continues. It's not just any particular death. He says, whose, uh, whose flesh has eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. What's Aaron describing? He's describing a stillborn baby. The Torah links leprosy with the white colorless skin of a baby born stillborn. 
So come back to the, the second sign. If we consider that Moses' hand was kind of a, a fake leprosy because a moment later he puts it in his cloak and pulls out it again and it's and it's and it's restored. Uh, what could that be referring to in the Israelite suffering back in Exodus 1? Did Israel ever experience a lie uh, related to stillborns or fake stillborns? Well, um, so in Exodus 1.15, I think we have the connection. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other named Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, he shall live. So um, another Hebrew commentator, Jewish commentator from the, the mid mid medieval time said, uh, named Ibn Ezra commented that Pharaoh was asking the midwives to secretly kill the male children as they came out of the womb and then you know, present the child and say, I'm sorry. Um, You've given birth to a stillborn child. This was what, what Pharaoh was asking those midwives to do. It was to be a fake stillborn, which, um, which was to, that was, that was Pharaoh's plan. But it didn't work, obviously, because of the heroic resistance of Shifra and Pua, who, who risked their lives to, to disobey Pharaoh's, um, Pharaoh's command and, and, and tell a lie to try to protect the lives of these children. Uh, that, that, that heroic thing, uh, brother, uh, um, uh, I'm not going to remember. Um, anyway, a, a, a dear brother whom, whom you all know, I'm just, I can see his face, but my brain is forgetting, uh, made a point once in a series of classes that God is like, never names the Pharaoh's name in Genesis one or throughout the whole thing, but he names these midwives, Shifra and Pua. They're, they're being elevated and named and honored and, and Pharaoh is not as being dishonored by not, by his name, not even being mentioned. So just a, a small point there, um, which I thought was powerful. Um, so Pharaoh's uh, lie that he was asking them to make about the, about these stillborns or, or about these children call them stillborn. Um, his, his plan was foiled by the, by the faith and heroism of these two midwives. Um, so that forced Pharaoh to go to the Nile as his murder method instead, which, which we looked at already. God is saying in the second sign, he knew those lies too, that, that Pharaoh was, was commanding the midwives to do. So what about the third sign? Uh, what could that be representing? The, 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 what could the staff turning into a snake and then coming back to uh, becoming a staff again, what could that be pointing to? Well, a clue is in the, the third sign, this third sign, uh, or sorry, back to, back to the third sign, the water turning into blood was the um, first plague. The second sign, going back one step, was referring to before the plagues with the with the lie that Pharaoh wanted the midwives to tell. So if you follow the pattern going back, um, so this um, sorry not the third sign the first sign here would go back to even earlier. And I think that 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 earlier time had to be before the midwife part of the story in one chapter one verse fifteen is told. We have to look earlier. That would be, I think, in chapter one, verse seven, when the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly, they multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So when we read that, um, we, there's, there's, there's a lot there. The, the, we can see how there's echoes back to Genesis 1, this being fruitful and multiply. This is what was happening. They, they started out as 70 people who went down to Egypt, uh, and now they've become this vast multitude. God has blessed them. 
but looking at the passage carefully, you can look at it from more than one perspective. And in, in some of the, the, the vocabulary, there's actually a looking at it from, from Pharaoh's perspective. And, and, and that continues as you read further in, the, in, in chapter one. It seems like the Egyptian perspective of this multiplying um, is also in one of the words here that goes back to Genesis one. The word that's translated increase greatly uh, is the word in Genesis one for the swarming creatures used for the sea creatures in chapter one, verse 20. Um, when God said, let the, let the waters swarm or teem with swarms of living creatures, it's describing a population explosion, uh, like some of the other vocabulary in, in, in here in chapter one of Exodus is, is, is using. But that word is often used in a negative context. Later in Exodus, that's, this is the word that's used for the teeming frogs of the second plague which Pharaoh you know, saw as, a, as rightly saw as a, as a, as a horrible thing. They were, they, were, they were taking over everything, this teeming swarm of creepy crawly things. Um, that kind of terminology, this word kind of has that kind of uh, terminology to it. From, from the, so from the Egyptian perspective, the people were like these swarm of, uh, of uh, horrible pests, uh, the, the incredible faith, uh, fruitfulness of the Israelites was like the threat of an army of swarming creatures that were invading somebody's home. This picture here is a picture of uh, locusts. This is a, a literal a, a photo of locusts in, in North Africa. Um, I forget which country, but in North Africa, just filling the sky. Um, there's just so many of them, countless uh, swarms. Of, of of locusts and this happens i remember um just a few years back uh, this happened in, in kenya where we lived um after we had come back home i remember hearing about how how that horrible thing had happened there um thinking back to our time in kenya we had an experience that was kind of like this overwhelming swarm taking over our home when uh this swarm of bees just filled our home. They, they decided to take over our home and we, we all got out as quick as we could. And um, except for actually Aaliyah had to stay, but that's another story. Um, but she was under an, a, a, an insect net, a mosquito net to protect her from, from the bees. But anyway, I kind of know what that feels like to, to have this swarm taking over your home. And that's how Pharaoh was looking at the Israelites. He was thinking of this, of, of this swarm that was growing exceedingly strong, which was kind of taking over his house. And that's why Pharaoh says um, in verse nine, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. So we have to deal wisely with them. Uh, so that sense of threat that Pharaoh had really just came from his imagination. Um, and as a result, he acted on that, that sense of fear of threat and oppressed the Israelites. But the more they were oppressed, we, we know that God blessed them. And the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And it says in verse 12 of Exodus 1 that the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. This, that, that word there has a sense of recoiling and horror from these teeming, swarming multitudes of Hebrews that they saw as a threat, a swarm of creepy crawly things that had taken over their home. This was really the beginning of a propaganda campaign that Pharaoh was using uh, against the Jews to convince his people to become accomplices to genocide, culminating in the throwing of the, of the uh, baby boys into the Nile. The first idea is that the people were a threat or could easily become a threat. The second idea was that they were more cunning, and so we have to outsmart them. And that's that's really gets at the as a way of avoiding your people from listening to the cries of the of the victims, because you know a, a cry from people for help, you know, would tear at the heartstrings of, of most people when when they're dying. Um, but if you convince your people that this could be a trick, don't give in to that, 
then then they go through they can more easily go through with the, the atrocious acts against these human beings fellow human beings um so you, so I was saying you can't trust these people they're too smart they're too cunning and the third idea which is captured in in this word for um becoming a swarm really is that the that they're less than human they're imposters they're subhuman this creepy crawly language uh, fits with that purpose to to view the Israelites as less than human, like like insects, and and it, it, it's it's a strategy that's been used in, used in, in many a horrible atrocity uh, that's been carried out against other peoples. The Nazis referred to the Jews as Untermenschen, kind of subhuman, uh, or as rats, or um, as lice cockroaches foxes vultures etc um there there was a, a book that um was uh, i saw a little article about called less than human how we how we um dehumanize enslave and exterminate others that's so it's about viewing others as less than human that's really the the start of 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 genocide the hutus in Rwanda, referred to the Tutsis as cockroaches. Um, they're not human. Exterminate them. And the people could do atrocious things because they view these people as less than human. So Pharaoh is preparing his people to do horrible things against the Jews as well in the same way. Um, to feel you know, disgust, repugnance, and dread uh, for these people um, when they saw them, when they saw the swarms. So you know, that, that kind of thing, kind of when I was asking, like, how in the world could people do the things that are being done uh, in Israel lately and Gaza? It, it makes me you know, think back to this lesson that I saw that it actually, we can see it here in Exodus as well. So Pharaoh saw the Jews as a threat, as cunning, as subhuman. And you think about if God were to try to capture those lies in a word or in a symbol, what would he choose? Well, the serpent is something that captures all three of those uh, for people who are familiar with the biblical text. So that's why the, that third sign would have spoken to the Israelites. The snake, or so the staff, is cast down and becomes a snake. And the snake is like, think back to Genesis 3, it's like an imposter human. Uh, you know, it, as part of the curse, it had to go um, on, its, uh, on its belly, which seems to indicate that before that, maybe it had legs and could walk. And it, so it walks and it talks like a human. Uh, it seems to have human-like intelligence, and yet it's not quite human. Uh, and so the serpent, and the serpent of Genesis 3 was more cunning and crafty than any beast of the field. Uh, so you can think of why it would be that, that Pharaoh would use, or sorry, what God would use this symbol to represent the way that Pharaoh viewed the children of Israel, the lie that these were subhuman people. The snake per, 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 perfectly captures uh, what the Egyptians thought of the Israelites as an imposter, as a threat, as subhuman, which, which would make it easier to justify mistreatment and, and heinous acts of violence. So why the, the thinking about that, that symbol, the sign, a little bit more uh, in detail, it was a staff, then it became a snake, and then Moses picks it up and it becomes a staff again. What's with that? Is there something hidden in that? Those chain of events. Well, the word staff, the Hebrew word mate, is a word that's more often translated as tribe. Interesting. Staff and tribe are the same word in Hebrew. Now, I think part of the reason for that is like a staff is something you can lean upon, you can trust. Uh, that can support you and help you in your walk. Well, that's what a tribe can do as well, your people. 
your people are there to support you and, and, and help lift you up when you're going through difficulties. And so the staff is a perfect symbol of, of, a, of a people, of a tribe that were cast down to the ground and treated as snakes. And then is treated as, as subhuman. But then Moses reached for the serpent. Well, actually, first think about his, his uh, response when, when, when it first happened. Moses like, was like, ah, and he, he, he ran from it. He was, he was repulsed with fear, just like the Egyptians were repulsed with fear by the, by the teeming numbers of Israelites. So God was exposing the lie. This wasn't really a snake. This was a staff. This, these people, this tribe of Israel, were not really subhuman. They were, a, they were people. They were a tribe. And God's like exposing the lie because when Moses picks it up by the tail, um, now think about that. You wouldn't, if you're trying to catch a snake, you don't grab a snake by the tail because they just bark around and like bite you. You, you grab it right behind the head so that it can't get you. But God told him to pick it up by the tail, which is not something you would do to a snake. But this wasn't really a snake. This it was just a fake snake. It was an illusion. And the illusion evaporates when he picks up the snake because it becomes a staff again. God in this, in this sign, in, is, in this first sign, was telling the Israelites, I understand how you've been treated and I understand the lie that's been perpetrated against you. That's the root of the killing, the enslavement, the mistreatment. The lies that culminated in the blood of the Nile started with this lie. And God said, I understand this. I understand what you, how you've been lied about. So when you see this, you see how those three signs show God's empathetic, compassionate understanding for his people that he understands what had been happening to him, the lies that were behind the Egyptians' mistreatment. And this helps the people believe. They believe that God knows and understands the secret things that were being done to them. And so now we can understand why um, they, they responded with belief and, 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 and praise and, and thanksgiving to God. Ah, I, f- I forgot my slides. Forgive me. Um, so we answered why it was a staff. Uh, it was a tribe cast to the ground. God exposes the lie. It really was uh, a tribe. And so when Moses grabbed by the, t- by the tail, um, he was demonstrating that this wasn't really a snake. This was a staff. So the people believed And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and they worshiped. They gave thanks to God. So, so what we've seen so far, we've seen the three signs, the snake, the leper's hand, the water to blood. And we've seen how all three point back to a lie. The the, the snake points back to the subhuman lie. The leper's hand points back to a still, the stillborn lie. The water to blood points back to children that were not killed. But the reality uh, was made evident that God saw the blood that was in the Nile. He saw the blood that was there hidden in that water. And he revealed it to the Israelites first with the sign that Moses brought to the elders. But we also saw that helped to help us understand it, that it pointed forward to the first plague. It pointed forward to the whole Nile turning to blood. So the signs don't just point backward to the lies. They also point forward to the exposing of the lie and the redemption that comes with truth. And when the truth is revealed, again, thinking of another, you know, just horrible um, acts of, of, of human mistreatment, the power of truth could be seen in another thing in history. Um, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, or, or a commission, I think it was called, in South Africa, after apartheid came to an end, the, the, there was wisdom in, in actually setting up this opportunity to, to bring things that had been hidden, 
that horrible things that had been done were brought to light. And that was so important to help the victims in the nation heal and start to bring healing to the rift uh, between the white and the black of South Africa. Um, so it makes sense here when God is revealing the truth, when, when he made the whole, the whole Nile turn to blood and revealed, made it clear for all to see that there's blood of innocent children in those waters. God was bringing the truth to light. And that was the beginning of, of the, uh, the redemption process. So it, it magnified the symbol and brought the truth to light. Now, could the first and second signs also portend to a future uh, redemption and uh, revealing of the truth? Well, do we hear echoes of the first signs later? The leprous hand. That we went back to the, the lie of the of the the babies that you know uh, Pharaoh was saying kill the babies and pretend they're firstborns. That was the the lie of the leper's hand. So if you think about what that points forward to, that would point forward to death of children in the tenth plague. But you know, there's things that some things that don't seem to connect. You know, you have children dying, but is that all there is? I mean, the Egyptians firstborn didn't get leprosy and they weren't really dying at birth. They were firstborn, but some were, you know, older and some were kids, but it was just the firstborn in every house died. Um, but they weren't really dying at birth. Uh, so is there is there more evidence that we could say that the second sign really points forward to the the 10th plague? Well, there's a vocabulary, a couple of vocabulary hints as well that really, I think, confirm this. The In Exodus 11, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, yet one more plague, uh, one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. That word plague, believe it or not, is only used once in Exodus. The other nine acts of judgment upon Egypt weren't named as Negaim, the, the, the Hebrew word nega is this was the word here used for the plague. Um, if you look at uh, um, on, in my computer program, I, I pulled up that word in a bar chart, and you can see in Exodus, it only appears one time. I don't know if my cursor will show up on the screen. I'm not going to try. Um, but there's a little blip in, Ex in Genesis, and there's a little blip in, in Exodus when uh, the 10th plague happened, what we call the 10th plague. No, no place else. But look at that big spike in Leviticus. What's that all about? Where, what was happening there? Um, so, and that spike comes from all of these verses in Leviticus 13 and 14. And don't worry, we're not going to read them all. I know you can't even probably see them unless you really squint at your screen. Um, but let's let's zoom in on a couple. What's what's Exodus Leviticus 13 and 14 all about? Well, it's all about leprosy, a plague of leprosy, a plague in the skin of flesh, a plague of, is turned white, um, and the plague in sight deeper than the skin. So a plague of leprosy over and over again. Leviticus 13, 14 are all about leprosy. So God is in his in his word is connecting the tenth plague with leprosy, which then connects us back to that second sign. And there's more hints. Um, the Egyptian firstborn die in a womb of sorts. They're, 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 it's described that there wasn't a house in which the child didn't die. And those houses are really portrayed as wombs containing children. Because think about how the Israelite children uh, the Israelite homes were on this Passover night. There was blood of the lamb on the doorposts and on the top of the door. And when the word came that it's time, the people came through that bloody opening to leave Egypt. That's a picture of a birth. And Look at Exodus 4, verse 22. Think about what God said ahead of time. Thus you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. 
And I will say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, well, let's pause there. So God is likening his people as being born on Passover. Uh, well, it, yeah, on, I mean, later it would be clear that this was happening on Passover as they emerge from the womb of their homes through the through that opening, that bloody opening. They're being born as a people. Um, so, so he said. To, so God said to Moses, uh, relaying God's words to Pharaoh, says, "If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son." This was being fulfilled in the tenth plague. A nation was being born. It was birth. Um, but at the same time, that's happening with Israel in the Egyptian homes. There's others that don't successfully live, leave their homes. They don't leave the womb alive. They were like children in a womb that were stillborn. And, and the mourning parents carry out their dead firstborn through that opening of the doorway. As a, and they have a stillborn child in their hands or a stillborn, it could be, you know, an older person, but it still captures that image of a, still, of a, of a stillborn. So now the lies of Pharaoh's plan in this in the tenth plague are reflecting back upon him and upon his people when the firstborn are becoming the stillborn. So what about the first sign? Okay, that first sign, there's a what's the redemption? What did that point forward to? So it pointed back to the lies of the serpent. So what would that point forward to? Well, if you think about the timing. The third, third sign went with the first plague. Going backwards, the second sign went forward to the tenth plague. So going back to the first sign should bring us forwards to something after the tenth plague. Well, there's a, a language hint as well. Um, sorry, that should say four three in Exodus four three, in describing the sign. God said, throw it on the ground, and Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. The Hebrew there is really ran from the face of the snake, um, literally. And there's only one other place that uses that word for running and that word from the face, and that's in Exodus 14, when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea after the 10th plague. The Egyptians, their chariot wheels are clogging. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel. That's the same words. It's, it's the, I mean, it's, it's conjugated differently because it's, it's, they're saying it to each other, let us flee. But it's the same, same verb that's used of Moses fleeing from before the snake. And it's from before the face, literally, of Israel instead of um, from the face of the snake. So there's a connection, Israel, the face of Israel and the face of the snake. So if, this, if you take that hint, then you can see that or the, the cross, cross, going across the Red Sea is this vast line of people that are the snake that you know, Moses or sorry Pharaoh called them a snake, and now they literally looked like a snake, and and Pharaoh was wanting and the Egyptians want to flee from before the face because God was fighting on their side. Um, you know, think about when when uh, Moses said, "Catch them by the tail," or "Catch catch the serpent by the tail." Here, Pharaoh and the Egyptians have one last opportunity. They could grab hold and and treat Israel as as not subhuman, but real humans who have been victims that they were the aggressors towards, and and they have a chance to to make, repent one more time, um, but but they don't do it. And the, the last uh, link is uh, the, the belief idea. God said in, four, in Exodus 4.4, 4, you know, catch it by the tail and it will become a staff that they may believe, that the Israelites may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to you. Well, that belief word doesn't happen again. Um, I mean, other than when they did, sorry, in chapter five, uh, four, they believe uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the signs. 
when the signs were actually carried out before the before the elders, but we don't see it again through all the the signs of the ten plagues. It doesn't say that the Israelites believed. It's not again mentioned until now when they're crossing the Red Sea. And that snake, you know, the word snake is not there. There's a staff, but there's no snake there. But if you think of a picture, it, you know, I don't think the Israelites would have taken a straight shot straight across the Red Sea because under the under the water on the ocean floor the, or the sea floor, there's going to be obstacles and things that they're going to have to twist and turn around. And if you imagine this big mass of people going back and forth, or, or sorry, going forward, but kind of winding back and forth, it would look very much like, like, uh, like the way that a snake looks upon the ground. You look at one spot on the curve curving of the snake's body, and it's like it doesn't move side to side, or it doesn't move, or say, laterally from the length of the snake's body. It only is like moving forward, and but yet it looks like it's kind of standing still. I mean, in the uh, the Proverbs, it talks about you know the mysterious way of the serpent on the rock. That 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 the way that looks, you can imagine that that's the way the, the snaking tribe of Israel would have looked, but they weren't really a snake. It just appeared that way. They were really a tribe and God was redeeming them. And the people believed, they believed in the Lord and they believed in Moses who sent, who, who God sent them. Um, and it's just this beautiful picture of God redeeming his people. So those lies, God saw, he knew the lies that the people were, uh, that were told about his people and he knew their suffering and when he was going to rescue them, he didn't just pull them out, um, but God provided the acknowledgement that the things that they were suffering were, um, the, he knew the truth. And he made an effort to make that truth visible clearly to people that were witnessing these events as well. Um, God was redeeming his people and redeeming them from the lies as well. And that just shows the power and the wonder and the compassion of our God. And it made me think about, you know, like so many things, we can see scripture points forward to Jesus. Think about Jesus. He suffered at the hands of liars as well. They saw him as a threat, just like the Egyptians saw Israel as a threat. Um, we have the connection out of Egypt. I called my son. It's brought forward in the Gospels as quoting or as referring to Jesus. Um, we have that parallel, and and these people, the 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 ruling the people with power in the Jewish culture, they saw Jesus as a threat. They they saw him as an imposter, not one of them. He was something less than them in their eyes. Um, there's so many, there's so many echoes and, and, and mirrorings back to what we, what we just saw in Exodus. And when God saw Jesus uh, suffering, when God made sure, and, and in, the, in the scriptures, we see that God was revealing truth for all to see when the ruling Jews were trying to have Jesus put to death. You know, what was there? On, on above Jesus on the cross in three languages, so it would be clearly declared to all to see that this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. There was a declaration. This is this is the King. There was a declaration by Pilate. This man has done nothing deserving of death. The truth was being proclaimed and revealed even as Jesus went to suffer for us. And a deeper meaning to that came to me as I was you know, pondering these things yesterday. I never thought, I mean, I always thought of it as a judicial thing, like, okay, he's done nothing deserving the death penalty, but think about the, the declaration there. He's done nothing deserving of death. Well, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and have sinned. And the wages of sin is death. But Jesus did nothing deserving of death. In his whole life, he was sinless. 
God's proclaiming that. He's, he's putting down the lies, the lies of, of the Pharisees and the, and the ruling Jews, and, and saying, this is my beloved son. Uh, he, he says, he makes it clear, the Roman centurion declares, this surely was the son of God. All this truth is being proclaimed to, to combat the lies that were spoken about Jesus. Um, it's just really, really cool to, to see the echo uh, forward. And, and there's the echoes, of course, of how Jesus redeems us and what it, what it can tell us about why we can trust in God and, and grow closer to God, knowing that he's a God who cares. You know, think about the lies, the lies of the serpent uh, of sin. We are in bondage to sin because the, those lies that told us the wrong way to go, those lies that um, that say you will not surely die, um, God's God brings the consequences of sin to light. When Jesus died on the cross, He died because of our sins. It's not okay to listen to the voice of the serpent. We need to we need to to fight our human nature, our sin, and and put it aside and instead turn to God's ways. Um, Jesus is, is drawing us out away from those lies and, and setting us on a path to life. He's, give, he's giving us a new life. Um, and, and, you know, those lies also say to us, you're, you're not really worthy. You're, you're, you're um, you know, God wouldn't want you. God wouldn't care about saving you. Those are lies that we can tell ourselves when we fall and we sin and we you know, realize we really screwed up. But Jesus, when he suffered for us, was telling us the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that we could be set free from our Egypt, our bondage to sin, to a new life, to become his people. Once you are not a people, but now you are a people. Uh, sin tried to kill us at our birth within the house, but the blood on the doorpost, the blood of our lamb allowed us to be born again to a new life. So when we see the sign, the signs of the prophet like unto Moses, him shall we hear, we see that we have a great God who knows and sees our pain and our suffering, and we believe. We see the signs point what they pointed to and brought to the fullness of light. And that we see the revealing of truth that sin tried to conceal. The, sin, the signs are declaring the truth about sin that, and that we have a God who brings truth and reconciliation and redemption to his people and the destruction of sin. And we believe and rejoice greatly. Thank you.